I'm Dan Snow. Welcome to Voices of the First World War. In the years leading up to the centenary of the war, the last of those who actually experienced it have passed away. But the Imperial War Museums and the BBC had recorded interviews with many veterans to try to capture what it was like to actually be there. This series listens to those stories. Do you want me to tell something about life on the submarine? I will always say to my dying day that we should never have been where we were. We were sitting targets. By the First World War, combat had taken to the skies, lurked in tunnels below the battlefields, spread across the oceans and under them. By 1915, the submarine had emerged as a potentially decisive weapon. Britain's blockade of Germany had slashed Germany's imports by 50%. Staple foods and fuel were becoming scarce. In desperation, Germany turned to a young technology to strike back. Submarines, or Unterseeboots, U-boats. The total warfare was beginning and developing. We had to fight uh, the enemy. In February 1915, Germany declared that all UK waters were now a war zone, as submariner Martin Niemöller explains. We were looking for uh, war vessels of the uh, British and uh, French Navy, and then suddenly the change arrived when we were ordered to see our main object of activity in sinking merchant vessels, which certainly did not mean for us that we had to fight against the civilians, but that we had to sink uh, the vessel as a material of war for the enemy. Neutral merchant ships were to be sunk without warning, to starve Britain of raw materials, just as it was starving Germany. We had to use all our engine power to get far ahead of this uh, vessel on which we were to shoot our torpedoes, because the moment we had to dive, we could move only very slowly, three to four, at most five knots an hour, and um, we were satisfied and even enjoyed every time we sank an enemy's merchant ship. We uh, had the phonograph playing in the inside room of our submarine, the national hymn, Deutschland, Deutschland über alles. The whole family saw us off. Thoughts of war didn't seem to enter anybody's head. No. Alice Drury had been working as a nanny for a wealthy family living in America since the beginning of 1915. They decided to set sail for England in early May. We had had warning that they were going to uh, torpedo us. And I said to my employer, they're going to sink this boat so he should... Oh, don't take any notice, dear, it's just propaganda. And in any case, what could I do? The submarines have terrible, hard and short, shaking movements. The crew was packed like sardines in a box. That evening before, they did come and close the portholes. We were absolutely in the danger zone and they'd already sunk seven ships in that week on the very spot. We had a huge book on board with the silhouettes of every merchant ship in the world. German U-boat officer E. Spiegel. And we were very experienced to find out by looking at the ship what class and what society it belonged. We came into a fog. We would do to land in Liverpool on a certain tide and the fog held us up so therefore we were going slow just sailing along as if we were on a cruise my employer we were on deck pointed to land we could see Ireland from the distance everybody was excited this was early in the morning of the 7th of May Alice Drury was on the Lusitania, one of the largest and most luxurious passenger liners of its day. She was about to experience one of the most infamous events of the war. I carried on as usual, 
and uh, went to lunch. And my baby was about 12 weeks old at this time. And I went down to give the baby its bottle. And I took Stuart with me. I want to stress that the submarine is only a one-eyed vessel. That means only the one who is on the periscope with one eye has the whole responsibility for attacking or the safety of his ship and crew. While I was feeding the baby, it was terrific bang. My instinct told me what it was. Well, I just picked the shawl up, wrapped her in it, but I tied the shawl off the corners around my neck and I crossed over to Stuart and he was crying, well, I don't want to be drowned, I don't want to be drowned. He's just old enough, you see, to understand there was something wrong. And I said to him, no, darling, you're going to be all right. Hang on to me, never mind what happens. If I fall down, don't let go. I said, if you obey me, you will drown. In these early days of submarine warfare, rules of engagement were ever-changing and often misinterpreted anyway. There was little agreement on what constituted a military target or whether U-boats ought to warn and let passengers abandon ships before sinking them. There were times when we were allowed to torpedo every ship around England. A few weeks later, we got a new order. Torpedo only British or French or enemy ships. For God's sake, forget neutral ships. Well, as I said, out of 15 or 10 centimeter periscope, it was very hard to distinguish whether the ship was an enemy ship or a neutral ship. Merchant ships during the war never showed their flags. We got up one flight of stairs at the terrific bank, the second torpedo. In fact, this second explosion was not a torpedo. It was possibly a stash of small arms ammunition stored in the hold. The nurse was up at the top and she called down to me, what shall I do? And I said, well, then we're all for ourselves and don't worry about anything else. You just save the child and yourself. I never saw her anymore. We eventually managed to get to the top. Men who were throwing money and things of importance to their wives into the lifeboats. Was it a mistake? Or had the U-boat been lying in wait for the ship? There was one very dreadful and terrible accident when one of the huge Cunard liners, the Lusitania, was sunk. The commander of submarine who sunk the Lusitania, Captain Schwieger, was a great friend of mine. He was a wonderful man. He couldn't kill a fly. And still, he caused this terrible disaster. I was on the port side, and I had to climb to get to the boat. It was a climb, and a sailor came and grabbed Stuart, and I followed, and he threw Stuart to the lifeboat. And I went to jump into the lifeboat, and the sailor grabbed me back, and he said, it's full. There's plenty of room in the next one. I'm afraid I did get a bit hysterical. And I yelled, and <laughs> quite honest, I bit his hand. And he let go, and I jumped. As the lifeboat was going down, I went to the side of it. The lifeboat landed in the water, almost as I did. And a man who was in the lifeboat leaned forward and grabbed me by the hair. And I tippled over like that into the lifeboat. So I always say that my hair saved my life. The baby was very tightly round my neck. Nobody believed the Germans would dare torpedo a passenger liner, and certainly not the Lusitania. Did the British stand back and let it happen to bring the USA into the war? Conspiracy theories and justifications have swirled around ever since. U-boat officer Spiegel contributed to the BBC Great War series in 1964 and spoke about the U-boat commander 
Walter Schwieger. It was not his fault, not only in my mind, but in all Germans' minds. The reason for was the fault of the British Admiralty. There were three huge Cunard liners, as far as I remember, the Equitania, the Mauritania, and the Lusitania. And the, the Admiralty ordered that all these ships were overpainted in the British Navy gray. Now, when this submarine saw this huge ship coming, the captain had to sink. It was a transport ship, not a liner. And he would have acted against his duty if he had not fired his torpedoes. All those years back, I will never forget. The suction of the liner was pulling us back. Every time the oars went forward, we were going as if we were going to be drawn under. Eventually, we got away. The lifeboat I was in was the only one saved on that side. There was a submarine over there on the surface watching us. The sea was as calm as a pond. I don't think anybody would be alive to if it hadn't been a lovely, calm day. The Lusitania went down in only 18 minutes. Numbers are disputed, but around 1,200 people died. And, marking a significant turning point in the war, over 120 Americans. Women and babies coming back to their husbands. Oh, it was terrible. Just murdered them. You can't call it anything else. Sailors on that submarine that torpedoed us were awarded by having a medal. Hmm. Of course they were doing their job, I suppose. And they couldn't help it, could they? The First World War was total war. Enemy factories, ships, warehouses and workers could be as important to the war effort as the soldiers on the front line. Everyone, it seemed, was now a legitimate military target. We often tried to save lives and, whenever possible, to take them in tow and bring them near the coast and give them what they needed in cut. Cut. It became more and more dangerous in the end of the war. It really was a mortal risk uh, to go by submarine because out of three submarines which went out from harbour, only one came back again. Martin Niemöller served in the Second World War, then became a Lutheran pastor and a prominent voice in post-war reconciliation. He was the author of the poem, First They Came for the Communists. Alice Drury gave her remarkable interview to the Imperial War Museum in 1989, Age 91. The horror to me, as far as the memories go, is to see that beautiful boat, a huge ship, supposed to be the largest in the world, wasn't it, disappear under my very eyes until the ship had gone and the sea was calm. And all I could see all over was, was bodies of, of, of wreckage floating. That was, that's the last memory. And this side was the submarine watching. 